Now, we've been giving you some information over the course of this week because we managed to extract quite a lot of very good information out of the Home Office up to March of 2020. We are still awaiting uh, the most recent figures of uh, illegal migrants coming into this country. But all week we've been watching uh, uh, video footage of various boats, dinghies, uh, dirigibles of all sorts arriving on the shores of this country uh, with border force um, acknowledgement and with uh, the ability for all of these people to land here uh, and find their way to hotels where they're going to be put up at our expense by Serco. So um, now that we know all of that, we're trying to figure out what the government is going to do about it. And we, as we collect more information, we get more and more uh, interesting developments. And one of the developments that we discovered over the course of the last few days was that one of the big countries where people are coming from is Albania. And Albania, according to the figures that I've got here, uh, is a place where something like 3,467 migrants came from uh, up to the end, the year-ending month. March 2020, which is an increase on the 2,478 that came here uh, in the year ending March 2019. Uh, now, we're going to talk to Stuart Jackson, former Tory MP, of course, former special advisor to David Davis, also um, a former chair uh, of the uh, Albania Committee in the House of Commons. Let's find out from him what he can tell us about some of these Albanian asylum seekers. Stuart, very good morning to you. Welcome. Good morning, Mike. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. I mean, I've been told by, by sort of people I know in the, in the law enforcement community in the past that there's a big problem uh, with the Albanian community and drug running and the fact that there's a lot of Albanian drug gangs which run the cocaine business basically in this country. Uh, what can you tell us? Well, I think the question has to be why people from Albania, which is a very small country uh, adjacent to Greece, are traveling over half a dozen or more countries to come to the UK and claim political asylum. Mm. Now, Albania is a very poor country. Uh, it's, it's what you would call a second world country, but nevertheless, it's not quite a failed state. There is endemic corruption there. It's, it's very poor by European standards, but one wonders why uh, young men uh, deem it necessary to come here. And I think we need to look, when we're admitting people on the basis that they are seeking asylum, at the potential criminality of different groups. And I think you're quite right that anecdotally, and I think factually, certainly the Metropolitan Police will tell you that some of the most, most ruthless uh, uh, criminals involved in drug running in the UK, including county lines, are in fact Albanians. And one has to ask how they got here, whether they sought asylum or whether they sought indefinite leave to remain through the proper processes. But in any event, we should not routinely being, uh, be in a position of admitting people as asylum seekers from such a small country without first checking uh, you know, what they will be doing uh, in the period before their asylum application is is decided. Yes. And this goes to the heart of the matter, really, Stuart, doesn't it? Because one of the problems we have uh, is that with these people coming here uh, without, in some cases, identification, uh, without, in some cases, any kind of reference point so that we can check who they are, whether they are who they say they are, I'm not even sure we can do that. Um, and while they are indeed applying for asylum, they're technically speaking not supposed to be working. So they can't do legitimate work. So you can only assume they'll do illegitimate work. Well, yes, because they don't appear to be the resources available in order to monitor the, the huge numbers we're talking about, scores, if not hundreds of thousands of people who mm. are in the asylum system. Right. Uh, once they are released from short-term accommodation to local authorities, and you talked about a disproportionate number yesterday being placed uh, in the East Midlands, for instance, yeah. then there isn't a practical way for law enforcement to monitor them. They're not under the probation service. The police are too stretched. Adult social care, it's not their area. And I think we need to ensure, as you've alluded to this week, that at the point of entry, they receive a proper health check. They get a COVID uh, health check. Uh, they also explain on what basis their um, asylum claim has been made from a country, for instance, like Albania, which is in a different league to, say, Somalia or Libya, where there is 
a civil war and there is no civil society and, and society is effectively broken down. Albania is not in that position. No, these but we keep hearing though, Stuart, that all these people coming are desperate people coming, fleeing wars, you know, fleeing famines. That's not the case here, is it? No, and it, it strikes to the heart of a central hypocrisy of so many of the EU countries. They signed up to the Dublin Protocol, which does specifically say that you will be adjudicated as to the bona fides of your asylum application in the first safe country into which you arrive, which for many people will be Italy, Greece, perhaps Germany, certainly France. So the idea that people from Albania, which is a thousand miles away, have travelled through all these countries and are then seeking uh, at any cost to get into the UK, mm. I don't think stacks up. And I, I do think that we need to ensure that our friends and partners in the former, our former uh, members of, of the EU do actually abide by the Dublin Protocol because otherwise the whole system breaks down. Exactly right. And the other problem that I can't seem to find an absolute answer from the Home Office for uh, is exactly what does happen, for example, once these hotels are emptied and once these asylum seekers who are still uh, uh, seeking asylum um, are no longer being put up by Serco because Serco can't tell us exactly when they're going to be letting them out into the community uh, because they don't know. They say we operate under the Home Office guidelines and Home Office kind of, you know, uh, advice. So... As and when COVID passes, I suppose, whenever that is going to be, they will be presumably taken out of those hotels and housed in uh, independent sort of residences in various parts of the country. Yes, exactly. And the fact is, we know that they will go into the informal or the black economy. Uh, they will work without paying taxes. Yeah. Uh, they, you know, perhaps they will do jobs other people won't do. But it, it, it does... It does make me laugh when people like Nick Thomas Simmons, the Labour shadow Home Secretary, talk about a lack of compassion. Oh, yeah. Because as you rightly said yesterday, there is nothing uh, compassionate about acquiescing to the vicious, violent people traffickers who put these people's lives in danger. And there's nothing compassionate about facilitating further drug trade, further county lines affecting young people across the country. You know, this is Labour's problem. This, this politically correct virtue signalling does not do any good at all. It's complaining about a problem, but a failure to put any pragmatic or practical policies as an alternative in its place. It's, it's nothing to do with compassion. It's about the first duty of any government, which is to protect its own people. Exactly right. And given now that we've got a quarantine in effect from four o'clock tomorrow morning on people coming back from France who have been on holiday there, I mean, I'm hoping but not really expecting that we shall put these uh, these people that are arriving on, on illegal dinghies in quarantine for two weeks as well. well I mean, well, you know, otherwise, what's the point? I mean, if I was on holiday in France, I'd just come back in a dinghy. Well, I, I do think a, a very interesting point was made by, I think, one of Julia Hartley Brewer's guests last mm. week, a, a former senior naval officer, that uh, it's not impossible to follow the example of the Australian stop the boats campaign there are now uh, there is free capacity on cruise liners uh, to keep people offshore and to have them processed offshore mm. the idea that maritime law inevitably means you have to accept everyone that turns up on your shores and you have to have an asylum system that takes years and years I know from my own experience that a lot of people who play by the rules and do the right thing and have the right paperwork are put through purgatory by the immigration system. Yeah. Whereas those that have sought right from the beginning to avoid the legal system and to come in as illegal immigrants are so often favoured. And I think it's a basic issue of fairness. And I think more power to Pretty Patel's elbow as the Home Secretary. This system absolutely has to change. We need new legislation we need a tough but fair approach to protect the best interests of the British taxpayer. Absolutely right, because we also hear uh, from the virtue signalling crowd that basically, you know, we're, we're dealing with such a small number of people, uh, you know, it's negligible on the, on the population. But given the Home Office statistics that I'm looking at, Stuart, that we got this week, from 2010 until now, you're talking about 400,000 people coming in this way. It's an awful lot of people. 
Yeah, even even Gary Lineker couldn't put them up in his mansion. No, I think. but he says he's going so to put many. one. He's going to put one up. So I mean, at least uh, I suppose we should say that we've managed to shame him into doing that. One of your um, uh, colleagues in the Tory Party managed to do that. So I take my hat off to Lee Anderson MP. We tried to get him back on today, actually, but he's busy with his with his constituents. He's actually uh, he's an actually proper old fashioned Tory MP. Loves his constituents, hates virtue signalers, wants to stop illegal migration. You know, we should get more of these people in, into the party, shouldn't we? Exactly. You know, most people in the Tory party are not against immigration. No. What they're against is rule breaking and illegal immigration. Yes. And I, th I think that's the key issue. Coming back to France, you know, I do think there's going to be some angst from the French about this. And obviously a lot of people are going to be inconvenienced um, coming back today. Uh, and first of all, I think actually it's appalling the price gouging of some of the uh, transport people, mm. the, you know, the airlines and, uh, and others. It, it's completely wrong to do this, yeah. but, but probably inevitable. But, you know, when France has a, an infection rate now almost twice that of the UK um, uh, and has, uh, you know, areas of, of the country which have seen significant spikes, I think it's right that the government has to act very quickly as it did in Spain to protect our long-term interests in the UK and make sure that we don't see a second spike as a result of people coming back from Europe, uh, places like the Netherlands and France with very high levels of infection now uh, and, and bringing that back to the UK. So I think the government's right, although, of course, people are going to complain and say how incompetent they are, even though they've acted very quickly. Yes, I mean, they can't win the government in this situation. I mean, I've been critical of them about some of the things that they've brought in, but it's difficult um, to imagine how quickly they have to act because I've also been critical of them in the past when they said, right, we're going to start wearing masks for a week on Monday. And I said, well, why don't you just do it now? So, you know, you can't really have it both ways. But it's interesting, isn't it, that these people who used to uh, give the government a hard time for having the worst record and the worst number of infections and the worst number of deaths, you know, they're not saying much about France and the ne Netherlands at the moment. No, and it's interesting also, I'm sure she's a very nice lady, but the New Zealand Prime Minister was lauded as the expert on uh, uh, COVID-19. Oh, yeah. She's the Nicola Sturgeon of the Southern Hemisphere, Stuart, didn't you know that? Yeah, but basically because she was female, you know, these weird uh, politically correct virtue signals yeah. that said, you know, all the best... Yes. Uh, management of COVID has right. been by women. That's right. And then what do you see? You see a big spike in uh, Germany uh, a few weeks ago, and, and now you've seen New Zealand mm. suffering. You know, it's ridiculous to make party political comments about something that the government is, is doing its very best to deal with. And we see that again with the A-level results. You know, Sturgeon did exactly the same in Scotland in terms of the algorithm and the predictions of the grades that this government has done, yeah. except that she buckled to pressure a few days ago. But if she thought it was right then um, to do it in the first place, then I suspect that, that the UK government is right to persevere with this. There will be some perverse results, yeah. particularly for talented young people in middling schools. And, and I feel for those young people uh, and I do think the government were a bit late in putting together their appeals process. But generally speaking, there's no other way around this. If 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 young people did not sit exams, you have to find a way yeah, exactly. to, and also, to all filter I'm hearing, those. No, I, I'm, I'm not going to be as generous as you are, I'm afraid, Stuart. All I'm hearing is a bunch of teenagers whining and crying and moaning about the way well, it's not fair. It's not fair. Yeah, well, guess what? Life isn't fair. Get used to it. We're in the midst of a pandemic. You know, stop being so self-centred and get on with doing something else if you can't do what you wanted to do. Well, Mike, I'm not quite as hardcore as you. Uh, you know, I was a teenager once, many moons ago. Uh, <laughs> but the, the point is, you know, this is, for some of them, this is their, their one and only big shot at something like medicine mm -hmm. or veterinary science or law in the universities and 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 i think as long as there is an appeal process for the for the tiny minority of, of young people that will be affected in that way who expected to get really good grades and have got just very good grades mm. i think we ought to knock on the head also this canard that this is this loony nonsense that we heard from the national union of students which isn't isn't a proper union it's a mickey mouse union frankly which most students have nothing was. to do with that it's all about class and it's about race. Yeah, it's That's nonsense. Yeah. The, the education expert Sam Friedman showed today in his results uh, analysis 
that actually children from poorer backgrounds have done slightly better in terms of university places this mm. year. And in fact, more young people are going to university this year. So yeah, it's not a perfect system, far from it, but it's not quite the you know uh, conspiracy that no. people who are hostile to everything the government does are making out. No, quite. Stuart, great to talk to you. Thanks very much indeed.